I read somewhere one time, and it's been super impactful, you know, the purpose of a goal is not to achieve it. It's to influence behavior. If you set bigger goals and they're aligned with what your purpose is and what your mission is, well, all of a sudden your behavior starts to change. What up to the point listeners, it's your boy, Chris. This episode is with my boys, the LSD crew. Uh, and it's the influencer panel from Rhino X 2024. This is a look into what our phone calls look like every single month. And he heard one of the episodes before, but it was a really, really great, really, really great panel. And we got a lot of awesome feedback from those in attendance about this panel. They hit on some fantastic topics that are impacting businesses right now. Enjoy with my homies, the LSD crew, my peer panel, LSD. So this group right here, um, we've called it LSD as our, as our group. I've never done LSD for the, for, just so you know. Okay, Brad, thank you for your transparency. Appreciate you. Uh, <laughs> so, but it's our own little peer group. And so we have a monthly call. We hold each other accountable. We're in text message groups, and I encourage you to do the same thing. So while we do bust each other's chops for like 80% of the call, 10% of the call we would probably get canceled for, the other part of the call is actually us talking about business. We share our numbers with one another. We're, we don't fake it. We do, we're not yes men. We don't disagree with you. We challenge each other. Uh, and, and it's been very helpful, for, I think, for, for all of us as a group and pushed us to, to be at our best. So I have a group I can rely on to give me the best answers. What I did learn this past weekend uh, as we were golfing as a group is that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the worst golfer of, of the bunch. When you're in this group and you are remotely bad at anything, there is uh, no leniency in the chops busting department. So uh, that was a really fun two days of golf. Can't wait till we do that again. So what I want to do, though, is, uh, is welcome our panel, the influencer panel. And I don't think, uh, I think most of you know who these, who these guys are. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole introduction. You can see their names on the screens, and they already did it. They all run incredibly successful businesses, or they're a part of different successful companies, and are incredibly knowledgeable. And I am, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful that I get to have a close working relationship with them, not as, you know, on the, on the personal level, but professional level, and lean on one another. In a lot of ways, it's, you know, you, I was talking to Goodrich about this, I think it was when we were uh, on New Year's, about there seems to be like we have this new up and coming version of the legends, right? And you have people who are creating influence, who've built some things and done some things. And I believe some of these guys on this panel are, are exactly that. So I want you to ask whatever questions that you want. I'll come around to you for the questions that I chose. But guys, I appreciate you coming on here. This is, we're going to treat this no different than if we hop on one of our phone calls, all right? So that's the agenda. Now, I'm going to ask a few questions. And remember, we have a Q&A at the end. The timer is right there, so don't ignore it, Tommy or Ishmael, okay? So first question I, I do want to toss out to you guys before I open up the room is, R was in here talking about uh, AI, the artificial intelligence stuff, and how he's looking at it, what, how it's being used right now, what they're looking at in the future, but what I was, you know, one thing that Chad and I were talking about when I threw out this question was like, well, how are you guys utilizing AI in, in your different business models? Because this is a conversation that we've had too, is not just what is it, but like, how does it actually work? How are you implementing the things and what's it actually doing for you? Is it easy? Is it hard? What are the things? So, so the first thing I want to toss out to you guys is how are you using AI in your different businesses? Who wants to go first? Um, I guess I, I'll kick it off. Uh, We've been uh, on, well, Dispatch Pro for over three years now. We were part of the original beta. Worked on that with Tom Howard as it went. So we are using Dispatch Pro. We've been doing that for a while. So that's one of the areas we've been growing uh, from an AI standpoint and still trying to understand and figure out how we can implement that more. But we were able to downsize dispatchers, remove some of the staffing for that um, through that program. And look forward to keep building on that. And then some of the call center stuff that we've heard too, uh, talking with some uh, some other companies in general about opportunities for AI booking online, AI texting and communication. So all those are things that we are working on right now too. So I think it's, there's so much going around. Even when I sit with our CTO and Mike, our CFO, and we just kind of look around all these things that are being thrown at us from AI, which one should you do? Where should you go? What's happening? Um, I, I think it, there's just the place that we really want to start resetting and focuses in the call center and follow up opportunities for AI. Um, and I think that's what most of the guys I know are trying to do too. So it's out there, it's going, it's, uh, things are moving in a positive direction that we've seen. And uh, you know, we're excited about where AI can go. It's just every day we're getting in, you know, hit with somebody with something new. Um, AI, you know, we, we use Rilla Voice. Uh, I think we've started throwing 
little darts at different things to test them, but then just trying to decide where's the biggest opportunity for us. And I think it's going to be in the call center while still supporting um, dispatch program. Uh, yeah, so for us, uh, to echo some of what Aaron said, I think the biggest thing is understanding that AI is, is definitely a sexy term, um, but understanding where you can plug it into the business um, that's going to drive results, right? If, if you have AI, where, uh, where can we utilize this uh, to either drive costs down uh, or to, to drive performance up? Uh, one of the main things that our team has built is uh, an AI tool that routes calls. Um, so we talk about you know, right tech to right call and different stuff like that. Well, we've, we've taken it to where we want right CSR on right call. So we use AI after someone calls. It's then guessing based on information within Service Titan um, and a couple of other different factors uh, as to why you may be calling so that we can then route that to the CSR. You know, if you're calling and you have, it looks up your information and you've got a same day, you got an appointment booked that day, well, more than likely you're calling to just check on when your appointment is or you're checking to reschedule. Well, we can send that to a lower tier CSR. Whereas if you're calling and you've got a system that's over 10 years old, um, or you are calling and you're a brand new customer, we want to send that to our very best CSR to get that call booked because that's a higher priority opportunity. So I think there's countless you know, ways that you can use it. I think just really investigating it um, and not being overwhelmed by it. Uh, one of the exercises, and I think it relates really well to kind of AI and all the new stuff that we get thrown at us, I think it's all great stuff. One of the exercises we do every single month with our uh, leadership team is we write down all of the projects on a whiteboard and then we cross off what do we need to stop doing in order to focus on the things that we really should be doing. Um, and I think that while that's not AI related, I think that AI and all the new technology that's out there that can be used, I think it's very important to focus in and not have... 18 new technology projects that are 25 and 30% done. Uh, work at the ones that you think are going to make the biggest impact. Um, see those out, get them finished, and then work on the next one. A little quick. <laughs> so we're, I always tell people we're a tech company that does garage doors. I could apply this to any widget. It's not just AI, it's BI and it's automations. We got nine campaigns. We're creating advanced, really deep integrations with Chirp. Millions of dollars being invested in the tech. Capacity planning, compliance, SMS compliance, Power BI, Data Studio. Just hired a very, very, very expensive uh, developer that has managed 4,000 developers. Uh, because I know how important this is. Dispatch Pro is not built for garage doors and service tight. So Tom Aravaje, they've invested in a huge team to come out and develop it for garage doors. We're developing with service tight the new, or they, they've invited us to help. They're going to develop it, but the phone's pro. Uh, a lot better. A lot of us have not been uh, excited about what phone's pro was, but what they're going to build is going to be way better than uh, I think 5.9 or 8x8 or any of those other phone systems based on their development team and their timeline, which is end of Q2, for those that want to know. And then we're building really, really, really integrated APIs that talk to Google with the GVP and LSA. So I think all these things combined, you just, it's going to be really hard to compete in the garage door industry when all these, we're, we're not only investing, but we're getting to the finish line and we're continuing to adapt these things to make them better. I, I think uh, perspective is important, so I, I think these guys keep me in the group to uh, remember where they came from. So um, <laughs> it's easy, uh, you know, it, Tommy says he hired a really expensive developer. I think Chad's got three full-time developers on staff. Um, I don't, so I'm not going to, probably a little unpopular opinion is that, you know, I'm really relying more on Service Titan and our partners to develop those products to implement them. But what I see in a lot of the businesses that I work in is that we haven't even got the basics of like implementing Service Titan correct up front, so we have no business in trying to implement the, the AI parts of it. So we do use Dispatch Pro, we do use Rilla, and those have made a mark in our business, but you know, AI, is, as I think Chad said, is, it's a sexy term, but um, I don't wanna implement a bunch of different products that are gonna be changing and, and this huge plethora of products that we're gonna have to keep trying to plug into our businesses and then pull out. So. 
I'm really uh, letting Service Titan get it right, and then uh, we'll implement it from there. So that, that's our approach on it. Yeah, I think to echo some of the sentiments down here, first of all, AI is a really, really, really cool thing that, like Ara said, it's going to be faster developing than anything else. But the reality is even the stuff we're talking about up here, Dispatch Pro is not AI. Dispatch Pro is a machine learning tool. It's AI is really mimicking human intelligence. And I don't think AI is at the point yet. It's very close, but not quite there, where it's actually profitable for us to use it. What it's really good at right now is making awesome memes where I can put like, if I tell it to put <laughs> Ishmael in a tutu and like put him on a sign, like it, I can do that in like 30 seconds and it's awesome. But can it answer the phone and like, you know, talk to a human and, and book everything properly? Not quite there yet but very, very, very close. We need to be watching out for that. And like these guys are saying, like everything that we invest in should be actually giving us a return. So, I mean, I think a lot of people out there are getting all excited, trying to be early adopters. Like, hey, look, we, we use AI, we use AI, we use AI, great. Like, what is it doing for your business? And if it's not doing something for your business, why are you doing it? Like, why is it, why is it another flashy thing that you want to have? So um, there's a few things that seem like, a, like machine learning, like um, Dispatch Pro, we use it. Second Chance Leads is a big deal listens to all your phone calls, figures out if your CSR says something wasn't bookable, but it believes you are. Right now, Service Titan's 88% accurate when it says it's bookable and the CSR said it wasn't. It'll alert your manager and the manager can call back on that lead and try to book that call. And they're finding a 33% booking rate on those where Service Titan alerted it and the manager called it back. And I mean, it's 33% of something that just we would have lost 100% of. That I can see the return in. In getting all excited about like, replacing a CSR and answering it, I don't see that yet. I'm in a second, Tom and Travis. Um, I'm in the same boat you guys are. I'm waiting for Service Titan to do something that's gonna affect the business in, in a positive way and increase the, the, the profit margins. I'm not gonna be out there you know, trying to figure out AI. I'm a contractor at heart, just like you guys are. I'm gonna focus on what I could control. I'm not too excited about this AI bullshit, to be honest with you. I'm more excited about like what's going to happen in the near future and how it's going to affect us. But I'm not going to focus on like, hey, when is it going to replace my CSRs? When like, it's coming. But let's fo let's focus on what we got to do right now, which is selling air conditioning, installing them, helping our plumbers, helping our technicians, helping our leadership team. That's what I'm focused on. I don't I don't really have the you know the vision to go past the AI thing. I'm gonna let Service Titan drive it, and then once it gets to the point where yeah, it's gonna help us out in the profitability. That's when that's when I'm gonna focus on it. Okay, I'll jump in real quick. Does anybody have any questions around that they might want to ask, kind of impromptu? No? Okay. Yeah, you got one? Let's, let's use the microphone. Tom, let's get back to this Ishmael and a tutu thing. <laughs> can, you, can you get that up on the screen? Uh, if I had AI on my phone, I could do it in about 30 seconds. Yeah. That was great, Ken. Thank you. <laughs> can we get one of Ken in the tutu up on the screen? And Ken and Ishmael together, that'd be cute. Okay, so I'm going to shift gears for just a second. For the sake of time, I'm going to ask this question on behalf of one of the attendees. So as, I mean, successful companies up here, some of you have done some acquisitions, some of you have done tuck-ins, all the different things. Or what, are, what are some of the main reasons that you guys are seeing at your sizes and the companies that you've acquired or that you're working with or that you've even coached? What are some of the uh, main reasons that most, you see most of these contractors that are failing to actually scale? So let's say we had the, the unicorn years, everybody was easy, the revenue's coming in, the sales were coming in, but maybe last year it was, hey, they're not here anymore. We kind of forgot about the business. Is it just, hey, no, there's just terrible. Like, what is it that you guys are seeing? Is there any consistency to why you're seeing businesses fail to scale? Analysis paralysis. Uh, just failure to make decisions and execute, you know, that just overthinking things and then uh, owners getting in their own ways. It's primarily what I've seen. Um, the biggest issue that I've seen with the contractors that, you know, hit the, the, the wall in 2023 was um, everybody was paying offense in 2021, 2022. Everybody was play, playing offense, scoring buckets, making sales, you know, 99% <clears throat> of the mistakes we were making were getting covered up by sales. 2023 was a defense year and everybody forgot how to play defense here and is making sure that we go back to the fundamentals of what got us to 2021, 2022. 
the biggest mistake everybody made in 2023, and I, me, including myself, was that I forgot how to play defense, and I was only focusing on the sales, and you, you, we need more sales, we need more sales, we need more sales, instead of like, hey, how do we make profit out of the sales that are coming in? How do we book more calls out of the calls that are coming in? Because I guarantee you one thing, everybody in this room <clears throat> does not close at 100%, does not book at 100%. So we, ha we all have work to do inside our operation, and it's the defense, the little things of, of minimizing the warranties, booking, booking better, uh, better calls, booking more calls, like all the little things that we don't, we don't like to work on is what made 2023 a failed year or a slow year for everybody. It was, everybody was too focused on, the, on scoring buckets instead of you know, playing the defense. Yeah, uh, you know, one of the things I think about when I, I think about scaling and, and talking with people about, you know, why they're hitting a roadblock or why they're struggling. Um, and a lot of that, I feel like, you know, the KPIs, I 100% agree with that. I'll take a different angle at it. Um, and, and that revol revolves around leadership. And, you know, the one thing that I see, um, if a business is small uh, and has struggled to continue to go, there's a lack of trust within the business. And that may sound like a really pie in the sky kind of term, but you know, it's, it's the leaders that, you know, if you're not willing to put trust in your teams, um, if you're not willing to put trust in your leaders and let them make mistakes, let them do their thing, enable them to be successful, to, and maybe sometimes even to fail, um, that's where I see, you know, hey, I can't seem to grow. It's like, well, you yourself are prohibiting the growth. Um, you're, you're pushing down on an organization that you actually want to come up, um, but you're only going to come up with the people that you bring up with you. And if you're not willing to bring everybody else up with you, um, you're going to struggle to, to move the needle and continue to grow and, and develop because at the end of the day, in order to scale, we're in a human capital business. We have to scale our people. Um, we've got to get, to, a, to their point, we've got to get our technicians to do more than they did last year. They're going to run maybe the same number of calls. Well, how do we get them to improve? Um, and then how do we get our service manager to take the same number of technicians and do more next year? Well, we've got to train, we've got to develop, um, and we've got to continue to work with them. Um, just in this one, it was kind of interesting because at Service Titan, we can see aggregate data all these companies, 14,000 companies. And we can see what's happening in the industry and trends, and we can see call volumes, inbound call volumes. So before you know, anything gets to you, and we're seeing call volumes go down. And it just ticked up recently, but during that time period, and we're seeing huge changes, Aura called me up and said, look, like, find out what, there's gotta be people winning. Call the people that are winning. And I don't wanna go into exact numbers, but it, there's some big changes over the past two years on what, what's been happening. And I said, okay, I'm gonna call some people. And a couple of people that I called, and they didn't know why I was calling, are up on this tent. Aaron was one of them, Chad, you're one of them. Like, we're calling down the line, talked to Tommy, we went through a bunch, and uh, Chris Hoffman, one of them, said, hey, what are you doing right now that's making a difference? What's changing? Look, I, I see that you're up 20%, you're up 25%, you're up whatever. And these are actual numbers, not, I mean, I know when we all sit around tables, everybody's BSing and making up stuff and it just turns into a measuring contest and whatever. It's, um, but these are actual numbers so I can see what's really going on. And almost everyone said the same thing. And it didn't seem helpful at first. Aaron said, he said, Tom, he's the first one. I'm, he's like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just doing what we've always done. I guess I'm going to the office kind of more. I don't know. And so I call the next person. So what is it? What's the silver bullet? What's going on? Uh, I don't know, we're just kind of doing what we always did. And so I, I started tra getting a little deeper and tracking it and I realized, I'll give you an example. Um, it goes basically back to leadership, which is what Chad's saying. Um, if you look at Aaron when COVID hit, I'll give you a, a prime example. COVID hits, <clears throat> everyone's freaking out. Everyone's, oh my gosh, you know, we didn't know if we we're gonna have terrible years at that point. People were afraid about going out of business. Like we didn't know, it was March of 2020 and lockdowns were just happening, and, and I mean, it was like the sky was falling, we'd never seen it before. Aaron talked to his company and said, okay, everybody's standing in a line. So he took them all out, has them all stand outside. You remember this story, Aaron? Yeah. I lived there. Yeah, he's, he, there. yeah, he's like, <laughs> well, I don't know if you remember telling me the story, but everybody's lined up outside. And he said, look, we've got a lot going on right now. You hear all this stuff in the news, you hear the media, the sky is falling, everything else. 
But I want everyone who decides that we're gonna keep serving our community, that we're gonna make sure that we're an essential service, that these people have plumbing, that we, we do what we can to save our nation, everything else, take one step forward. If you don't want to, stay where you are. And everybody took a step forward. Obviously, no one in that line is gonna say no at that point. He's like, if you're willing to go on homes, you're willing to do this and that. And at that point, he got buy-in from his entire team. And everyone's focused at that point. Hey, we're not participating in this. We're gonna move forward and we're gonna make it happen. And it's interesting that the companies that are performing right now are the same ones that have that leadership mentality that say, hey, we're, we're not participating in, the, in this you know, pullback. We're not participating in any recession. We're not participating in any of that. This is what we're doing. We're gonna hit our numbers. This is where we're gonna go. And they're just making it happen. And so I think that's the thing that is really separating. When I saw, I probably called like 15 companies going through that of all the top performers in the middle of this downturn and just saw, wow, like this, it's the same answer every time. And what it really gets down to is proper leadership and they don't know what they're doing because they've always done it. It's what's got them there and they're gonna continue to go. Warren Buffett said, you don't know who's swimming without their trunks on until the tide goes out. Well, I got news for you, tide's out and you're seeing whether or not you have your trunks on right now. So these guys, leadership's super important. I'm not gonna talk about that. I think if you double down, I don't think of marketing as getting leads anymore. I think of it as getting great individuals to come on our team. I look at the best coworkers, the difference between our top CSR and bottom CSR is massive. Our top dispatcher and bottom dispatcher, massive. Technicians, we're talking about millions of dollars from our top guy to our bottom guy. We're, we're hiring 30 to 50 techs a month right now. Capacity planning is everything in growth mode. And here's the deal. When people say, how are you going to weather the storm? I'm like, I like to dance in the rain, okay? Because we're going to figure out a way to make money no matter what. And that means if it gets bad, I'm going to be buying companies at a discount. I think the worst employee is a good employee. The bad employees get fired. The good employees just be okay. The great people take you straight up. So if you're not looking at your team and you're trying to figure out what marketing is gonna work and you've got all these low performers that you can't, I always tell every one of the people that work with me, if you got a will, I'll find a way. We will make it work if you wanna win. And we talk about competitiveness, D1 athletes, finding somebody that likes to play the game, finding somebody that loves to want more in life, dream bigger. And if they have that, they're on the team. If not, they'll fizzle right out, they're gone. And so, people, so many people are so slow to get rid of people when you don't realize you're bringing down the entire team by not moving them out or moving them up quickly. So I'll go back, build your team so strong that no one even knows who the leader is. I feel like guys pretty much covered all, but uh, I mean, I think we all know this, everything rises and falls with leadership. And uh, I think just showing up and showing your team that you're there every day and you're engaged. Um, I think, but back to the question I think you asked was, why, why do we think certain businesses are struggling? Um, maybe just not foresight into the future to see, to think. Um, you know, we think about the rebrandings that we've done, the brand campaigns that we built years ago, knowing and talking to great leaders in this room and thinking about, well, what is, what's coming into the future? What do we see? What do we need? How do we be competitive in this space? And I, I don't think people are thinking about what their brand, brand stories are, what the brand is, building different value propositions in the marketplace recognizing what you have and go, uh, what you have, what needs to be improved. And then, then some of it's just going back to the fundamentals, right? We all talked about this too a lot. It's like, just get lost in so much data and so much information, which is great, is when we started bringing too many people into those data conversations, it got really confusing for lots of people and things got even and worse, like just got worse in general. So it's just kind of getting back, simplifying back down the data and getting people focused on what really matters. And then as we, as we all said, it's just, I think it's just leadership and foresight and then talking to the greats that have done it and been through recessions and been through times and came out of the other side and hear what they've done and what you have and study the market, listen to the economic reports. Like you, you actually do have to spend time doing these things. And I, don't, I think a lot of small businesses just don't have that time. They're chasing a lot of fires, chasing other stuff. And they're, they, they, they're not looking that way. And I hope that, you know, and I, I was that and I have been that and just be able to have that foresight and as you said, you called, and he's like, what are you doing? He's like, we're just, we're just showing up and we're just showing love um, and just telling the team, uh, we just care more, about, care more about you, care more about the customers. Uh, just get back to that caring mentality. And I kind of have that on my bracelet here, just care more. And that's really what we started doing. Perfect. So we can get to as many questions as we can. If you're going to ask one, 
and you want to specifically like gear it towards someone, just ask them directly. But if you guys, let's just stick to like two, three. I guess, Chris, do you want us all answering the same? No, 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 you don't have to. If you feel like super passionate about it, answer the question. Okay. Um, But don't feel like everybody has to. So, Tim? Hey, guys, I had a question. Um, With all the issues facing our growing businesses, how do you prioritize what tasks to complete first? Obviously, um, things like pay plans, price book, multiple shifts, truck inventory. I don't know. I think people get all excited. I had somebody actually call me and say, hey, I think I'm getting a better deal on my service Titan agreement than you are. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and that's fine. And by the way, I can't negotiate with service Titan on my pricing. It's part of it. I have to recuse myself for legal purposes. But the reality is, it's like, dude, you want, you want me to spend my time <clears throat> calling service Titan to argue about $10 off per managed tech that's going to save me, I don't know, how, like, 500 bucks a month or something. I, I don't know. Like, dude, I, I'm not touching that. Like, I don't care. My time's more valuable than that. And so I would just look at the thing that's going to give you the most ROI. I mean, Tommy Mello talks about it all the time. He's like, look, if I increase my call booking rate from 70% to 80%, his call booking rate, by the way, is like 80 to 90 right now, but it wasn't always. If I increase my call booking rate from 70 to 80%, I mean, that's going to increase. It's not 10% more jobs. It's like, 15 because it's 10 divided by 70, right? He's like, if I can increase my job count by 14% or whatever that number is, is that going to just change my business drastically? You put that into your models and it just blows up. So obviously that thing should be focused on more than like, oh, you know, can I save 10 bucks here, five bucks here? And it's it's what, you know, we tend to focus on. So I just focus on the stuff that's going to have the highest return. I focus on the things that, that affect the business directly, like the call, the, the call volume and the call booking percentage. That is the huge thing that I've been working on this whole year and uh, uh, Q4 of last year is just being in the call center more because uh, me and Tom went through my call uh, uh, opportunities on how many opportunities are coming in through my call center. And we did a simple math. And just by increasing, I think it was 8 to 10%, Tom, we, were, we can increase gross profit by almost a million dollars we calculated per month. So that's probably one thing that I'm really focused on. <clears throat> yeah. So just real quick, Al Levy was like, where's your list of everything you need to do? I'm like, there's a lot of, there's whiteboards, there's spiral notebooks everywhere. <laughs> Getting it in a central location, Trello, Monday, Asana. And then he said, well, you build a top 100 list, you build that into a top 30 list, and then you get your top five. And you don't focus on anything else with that top five and have every single person on the team running towards the top five. And, you know, a lot of us commandeer the situation. This is more important, but allowing your your leadership team to pick what's most important and and have a fair democracy on what's picking the most important thing, because everybody's going to choose their own department. So it's really important that everybody's running together and the EIP, equity incentive units, profit sharing, those things help prioritize because they know it's going to not just move their department, it's going to move the company forward and they focus on the better for the whole. I, I think, uh, you know, tr- directly to answer your question and is that we recently acquired a roofing company and we're going through all those things. So we got with the team of, of the, the board and the management group that's already in place and we prioritize, as Tommy said, you know, what are our top five things from a rebrand, implementing service, Titan, building out the price book? A lot of those things feed each other. Um, so they kind of have to go in order. But I think the biggest thing that we did that made a huge difference is we put a, a date on all of them is when we expected those things to be done. So we're being held accountable to them. That got everybody on the same page and everyone's working towards those goals. But yeah, you really got to prioritize, you know, we can't really come up with a pay plan until we negotiate our material contracts and, and, and or uh, our price book. We can't set up our price book until we know our pay plans, negotiate our material contracts. So um, it's prioritizing what, what's going to make the biggest difference the quickest and cross those off first. Hey, guys. First off, thank you all very much for sharing your time and your ideas with everyone. There seems to be a common theme between all six of you in terms of your people and people-centric and investing in your people. Uh, My question is, what are the things that you do to invest in yourself, both personally and professionally, to make you a better leader? This year, I started spending a a way more time, like actually um, setting two hours aside for myself to be at the gym just to be able to clear my head. Um, I think that's probably had the greatest impact in my professional life, Um, you know, just 
getting those two hours, whether I'm by myself at home or I'm by myself in the car or I'm by myself going to a branch, like just spending those two hours working out or, or being by myself, I think probably had the, the greatest impact on the business because now I'm able to think a little bit more clear. Um, the one thing I do have that, that, that I lack of, I, I make rapid decisions, right? And just spending those two hours at the gym or by myself is giving me time to, to analyze those decisions and slow down the process. And it's helped me tremendously um, uh, impacted the business. You know, just in January, we were, imp we were able to impact it in a positive way on, on the profit side. Just, just me personally doing that. Yeah, I spent a lot of time, uh, especially in the morning, trying to get into the right headspace. Um, with so much stuff going on in the business, in the world, uh, with your people, all of that, um, a few of the things that I do may sound stupid, but they help me. Um, listing out what I'm grateful for. Um, I also write to my kids every morning. Um, so I have a journal that I write to, one to my daughter, one to my son, um, each morning just to tell them how I'm feeling. Um, and maybe something I learned from the day before or something I was planning on doing. Uh, for me, that puts me in a really good headspace um, and allows me to uh, kind of forget about all the, the crap in the world and really focus on what's right, um, what I'm grateful for, and then, um, then I can go out and help other people. Um, so that's been a really good exercise for me. Um, and then the other one that I do is I write a ton of thank you notes. My goal this year is 2,000. And uh, I'm, I'm still pacing pretty well. But to me, showing gratitude to others is one of the best ways um, that you can uh, care for yourself, uh, is taking care of others. And so if there's someone in the company, there's someone outside the company, whatever it is, just, just shooting them a quick note can be really simple, a couple of sentences, but just letting them know that you're grateful for their effort um, and you're grateful for uh, what they're doing to be a part uh, of the company or, you know, how they affected your life has been really impactful for me. So I'm not very good at time management, but I've got an amazing executive assistant and she's actually going to be my uh, chief of staff. And so one thing is I never really take time for myself. So we're working on the year and planning trips and planning time with my mom, planning time with my father, my niece and nephew. So I think that that's important to really own your calendar and build in the time preventively, like preventatively that you make the time for yourself. Uh, and I get a lot of consulting. A lot of people, I hire the best of the best and I hire specialists, not general practitioners. I hired Dan Martell to buy back my time. Uh, I pay him a fortune for one hour a month. <laughs> uh, and I've got a lot of, lot of, lot of consultants. I mean, I'll always invest in myself. I tell people invest in yourself, but it's kind of like I buy how I want to be bought from. A lot of people in a lot of the rooms I'm in, they're like, they won't invest in themselves. They'll never, they, they want to just get a deal on everything. But then they get so mad when people come to them and want to get a deal. And I'm like, if you bought like you want to be bought from, it would change everything. Karma, just the world has a way of doing that. So I think those are a few things. I think uh, uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of accountability in this group uh, for taking care of you know ourselves, our health, and and one of the things I did as as I went down that journey is I, I turned the music off and I, I kind of made a dedication to learning. So now when I drive around or I'm at the gym, I'm always listening to a podcast, and it's not just you know I, I've hired a coach, more of a life coach, to become a better father and a better husband. Um, I, you know, like most of us probably focus mostly on my business for the first part of my kid's life. So uh, trying to make up lost time there. And, uh, you know, that's also transitioned into my, my career and my business, too, um, with dealing with people is how to be, you know, a, a better person. So just making a dedication to learning and using my time effectively. I went rain with the bulls and had the bulls chase me in the streets. So to push myself, a couple guys in this room were there with me. So, I, I, just again, just getting out of comfort zone like that, running bulls, right? I'm 45, I'm running the street with the bulls. I never thought I'd be doing that, doing that. Went and ran, got, climbed a mountain with Mike. Uh, I'm a city boy. I, you should have seen me when I was training with one of those masks on, running around. Like, just, I don't know, just for me, I think it's just, of course, we've listened to audios in between. We've all started hitting the gym more, spending more time in that, but really doing things that are just completely outside of my realm. Uh, more recently, and I think those are the things that are pushing me to grow mentally, physically, um, 
over time, I mean, I, I think we, we read lots of books, went to tons of seminars for years, went and just went on a massive learning, visited many of the shops that are sitting here any hour, right? All these play, went to peer groups, just, I just in, went Ken, Dave, I mean, all, all these guys, these people like just, you know, engaging with all of them. So, but really right now, I guess what I'm doing is just challenging myself physically and mentally these days, a uh, different spot. And that's, that's what's kind of keeping me going. What was uh, your guys' best le- or most most uh, important lessons you guys learned going from twenty to fifty million? Twenty to fifty million? I skipped that part. <laughs> um, I think the twenty to fifty million dollar leap. Um, I think the biggest learning curve that I learned right there was knowing that I, that I hit my ceiling at thirty. Um, I was non I was non profitable at thirty million, um, and I couldn't figure it out. So the biggest lesson that I learned that stage was uh, seeking help and and being and being humble enough and being vulnerable enough to know that I didn't know what I didn't know, and and actually looking for help was the biggest leap that took me from thirty to sixty. Actually, um, is 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 knowing myself and knowing and 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 being able to say, hey, this is as much as I can go. I need help, and and looking for that help was was what got me to 60 and got me to 100 after that is is looking for the right help for sure i gotta say i think the biggest thing for me is believing i could do it um nothing against ishmael but like watching ishmael i'm like well if he could do it like (laughs) (laughs) i mean and it's true like you're like wow like well he like puts his pants on one leg at a time like he's a human like he can do 100 million like why couldn't i and i remember um it was actually Ken Goodrich was out at my shop years ago in Fresno, and um, Fresno's not exactly a really nice place, let's put it that way. Ken tells me all the time. And um, I, I was driving him back to his private jet, and I'm in my Ford F-150, like 2008 piece of junk truck, you know. This is like, I don't know, 2015, 2016, so it's definitely old and rickety. So I'm driving him over there and going to drop him off his jet, and he said, Tom, last year, I hit my, um, my last lifetime goal, which was to buy a private jet. And I said, okay. And he said, you know what? I have one regret. And I said, what was that? He said, I wish I would have made bigger goals sooner because I would have hit those two. And it, like, honestly, Ken, like that, I remember that like, like it was yesterday. I don't remember who was in the back seat. I think it was your Padawan or whatever it is from his, your former CFO. Uh, <laughs> no, but I mean... I remember, I remember looking at you, I remember you saying it and thinking, gosh, like, why do I keep making goals that are only this big? Like, I should have been making way bigger goals. And, like, seeing Ishmael, I think that year you went from, like, 30 to, like, 60 or something like that. And I'm like, what am I doing? I'm adding, like, two, three million in revenue each year. Like, why, why wouldn't I add 10 or 20 or whatever else? And that, it really changed me. Like, uh, that, when Ken was there, I think we were at 10 million in revenue, uh, 12. Yeah, and um, if I had all of those together this year, I sold one last year, it was $25 million in revenue. But even with that, this year, all of them combined, now I've owned some smaller percentages than a couple, but like we should be at 94, 95. And I mean, my goals at that time were go from like 12 to 20. I just should have made bigger goals. I should have been pushing hard, harder, and that really made a huge difference in my, in my trajectory. You're welcome. So, so I remember this vividly. I was doing 17 and a half million and my buddy Keegan Hodges came out and he goes, dude, the lighting in here sucks. He goes, how are you going to track grade A employees? He goes, can I get a, can I get an espresso? And I'm like, I don't have an espresso machine. He's like, you don't have an espresso machine for your employees. And then he goes, could I look at your financials? And he looked at my financials and he goes, dude, you are bleeding in four markets. And I know I, I know I got bad leadership, I know. He goes, no, no, no. You need to close these markets today. He goes, I'm not bullshitting you. He goes, you need to take a step back and you need to fix this. He goes, you'd be at 22% if you close these four markets. So I gave a package for the guys to move half of them, did close those markets. I had to start saying no and getting systematized and building a place where people wanted to work. I got through to 17.5 by pure grit and just being a one-man soldier, and I started to rely on a team and get smart on finances and create a place where people wanted to work. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add uh, one of the most important things for me is you're kind of going through that journey and you're, you're exploring 
places that you've never been, right? Um, and to Tom's point, I think setting those big goals is, is critical, knowing where you want to go. Um, I was talking with a few people last night about this, like, do you want to be a hundred million dollar contractor? Maybe, maybe not. And either way, that's perfectly fine. But I think if you're going to go from 20 to 50 to 100 to 200 to 300, like you got to know where you're going to go. You know, I, I read somewhere one time and it's been super impactful. You know, the purpose of a goal is not to achieve it. Um, it's to influence behavior. So to Tom's point, if you set bigger goals um, and they're aligned with what your purpose is and what your mission is, um, well, all of a sudden your behavior starts to change. And when you think about it, just like Tom said, you know, everyone, is, everyone that's done these amazing things that we all look up to, they're all human, right? They just put their mind to something that was maybe a little bit bigger than what we can see. Um, you know, I always tell our team, whatever your, I want you to write down your first goal, and then I want you to double it. Because I don't want you to achieve double what you think you can do, I want you to act like you can achieve double what you think you can do. Um, and I think some really powerful things are seen, especially as you get bigger and bigger. Yeah, there's a bunch of stuff from a mechanics and, piece, and pieces that you need to add and get a CFO and all of these things, but it really is for not if you don't know where you're going um, and you're willing to act upon those, those particular goals that you have. Great answer. So if the, if the question is, what is the biggest thing you learned from 20 to 50 million is that not everybody's gonna make it there with you. Um, you know, I had a lot of hopes that uh, lots of people on our team would grow into certain positions, invested in that, and some just weren't gonna make it. Um, you know, and that was a realization I had to come to. Uh, and it was a hard one because you, you know, some of these people were with your team a long time. Um, if you're very fortunate, if you have got a team that are able to grow all the way with you and uh, you know, tried to pull people along probably longer than needed to, uh, fought battles that probably didn't need to be fought and it probably cost us even more time, but felt like it was the right thing to do. But I'd say that was the, uh, the biggest lesson I learned. And then, you know, I remember calling Tommy and we talked about this and you're like, it's, you know, it's bittersweet. You've been through it. It's bittersweet. Remember it? And uh, then I had to make some decisions and I went back and revamped my whole entire leadership team besides Mike um, and reinvested in new leadership and new people and found new seats for other people. And had to have those hard conversations during that time. So I think that was the biggest lesson I learned is that I hoped that people were, were gonna be as ambitious and wanna be part of it all the way through. And the reality was they probably hit their ceilings or it, you know, we just had bigger dreams for them than they had for themselves sometimes. And I know you wanna hire that, but you know, and then your business moving fast. So that was, that was my biggest lesson learned. Okay, next thing is, um, what's the most recent thing you've implemented or changed in your business? Um, we terminated our CSR manager and got someone that was better at focusing on the outbound calling and making driving performance. It was, I, I think at some point you just got to call it like it is and just say, hey, we, got, we do what we got to do in order to move to market conditions. And right now the inbound call volume isn't there, so let's make calls happen. So. Um, focus uh, to Tom's place, focused on the call center because that's probably everybody's weakness in here. Um, the biggest weakness that we have as operators is that we always focus on the customer fulfillment, the sales process, the tech turnover process, all that because we're all good at it. Um, we focus on the marketing because that's what we enjoy. Um, the one th thing that we don't enjoy is all the, you know, the HR shit, the, the, the financial shit, the, the, the CSR thing, right? Like that's the one thing that I'm focused on. I made it a priority this year to spend at least one hour inside the call center and not just, you know, spend it there and not and be on my phone. I actually walk around, listen to the calls, talk to the people, find out, like, find out who's not performing, who's the bad apple inside the call center because everybody in here has bad apples inside of the call center that's driving down the performance of other people. So finding out those bad apples um, and, and identifying and actually executing on getting rid of them and keeping up the culture inside the call center is my main priority because, again, when, when Tom did that math for me, that simple math of increasing 8 to 10% 
booking percentage and how much it's going to affect our profitability. That was a, a huge eye opening. The rest of the the rest of the areas at our company, you know, the the we have the highest average ticket at Ranch. We have you know our closing percentage is good. Our, our service tickets, good. like every all the other metrics are already there. But the one per, the one th department that we were that we were lacking, just like you guys, is 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 spending time and incentivizing and and bonusing and and loving on the call center. That's the one thing I'm focused on. Uh, we, you know, we sit down with Quartec, our private equity company, and I, I look at the bleeding they pointed out. And there's bleeding everywhere in every one of our companies. And you could use Hatch, you could use HubSpot, we use Chirp. And a lot of people are using Chirp or whatever it is for automations at the very least. And so we came up with nine campaigns. Non-book calls, abandoned calls, rehash. We, get, we had 727 customer courtesy calls ran out by a truck last month. I could fix that with a message of the top five things that go wrong that you could fix yourself, manually, safety eyes. So we figured out on a whiteboard, we'll add $2.4 million a month if Chirp is running effectively. Making that work effectively of EBITDA, not revenue. Making that work effectively is a big task because you got to A-B test. Gary Vanderchuk at uh, your first event said, sometimes it takes 100 tries to get the right script, you know, whether it's a Facebook ad or whether it's a, you know, an automation. But I took that really, really serious. And that's the number one goal of our company is to stop the bleeding of all these different things. Even service agreements with automation you could run to hit the same zip code all the service agreements in one day for a little drive time. There's, we just found millions of dollars there. Yeah, I think uh, the biggest thing for us is, is really aligning on KPIs and metrics. Um, we can all say that we talk about average ticket, talk about conversion rate, um, all of these things that are you know, very common in the industry. Um, but I did an exercise where I walked around the office and I said, how do you calculate average ticket? Guess what? I got about five different answers. After five, I stopped and said, okay, we need to fix this. Um, and so, you know, really making sure that the organization is dialed in, not to just a KPI, but how it's calculated. Like, they understand and they believe that that is true data. You know, I love Service Titan. We've been on it since 2015, I think, something like that. But, you know, you can pull a lot of stuff out of Service Titan, but if you don't aggregate it properly, you may have four different managers getting four different answers. And that some may think they're doing good, some may think they're doing bad, some may not even know how to pull the report. And so we have used um, a third part, we use Power BI on the back end that, that basically pulls all the data out of Service Titan, aggregates it, um, and we have all the definitions in there, and everybody can understand that what, is, what they see there is the one source of truth. And I think getting to one source of truth is, has been critical in us, as we've talked about up here, is, is really refocusing on how the business works. What are the mechanics? How do we judge on a day-to-day -day basis, on a call-to-call -call basis? Are we winning or are we losing? Um, and I think having that visibility has been, been key for us here probably over the last really three months. Okay, one more, one more. We got one more. All right, how do I turn this on? <laughs> Glad you're so smart. Here you go. Okay, so <clears throat> where do you guys see this industry? What's, what's it going to look like in the next five years, in the next 10 years? I think it gets commoditized in the next five years. I think with uh, the manufacturers now going straight to the consumer, it's, it's bound to happen uh, with Amazon's innovations, with smart AC, with what's going on. It's going to happen. It, it's happening now. And it, I think you should, I think there's a lot of people in here with a 10 year plan. It should be a three to five year plan. Uh, I'm not saying there's not gonna be winners because we own the fleet, we own the people, but here's the deal. The prices will start getting fixed because someone's willing to do it and they'll figure out a way to do it efficiently. Amazon disrupted everything, everything. And if you don't think there's big disruptions coming, I think it happens not in 10 years, but in five years. In the next five years, what I feel personally that's gonna happen, I feel like um, somebody's gonna trip and fall and it's gonna 
destroy the, 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 the industry where we have to go back and glue it all together for these guys. Um, we saw it in the, AR, in, the, in the ARS model that happened, what, 20 years ago or in the, or in the Blue Dot model or whatever. Um, I see that um, there's going to be a huge monster that, that, that obviously everybody's got to keep building these huge monsters and the lack of structure inside those monsters is going to crumble the cookie and it, there's going to be a lot of pieces to pick up. And um, I think that there's going to be a huge opportunity for hungry operators in five years from now where those, all those cookies, that, all, the, all the crumbles in the cookies are going to be left on the ground and everybody's going to be able to pick them up. We, we talk about this a lot in, in, within the group of, of future opportunities. And another thing that's going to be really interesting to watch play out over the next, you know, couple of years, several years, five years, is to see how many people inside a lot of these groups have equity and how that translates into as these portfolios flip, what happens to these leaders inside these companies if they're going to stick with it, if the equity can continue to incentivize them to stick with it, or if we're going to have a large exodus of people um, in leadership roles. And if, if there is, what kind of opportunity does that present to people that want to go in and fix and operate these businesses? One more. Sure. I mean, it's just seconding what, what Travis said. I think that in the next, honestly, three to four years, we're going to see a pretty big exodus of a lot of air conditioning people that sold their business made 10 million, 20 million, and to them that's like a billion, and, and they're not gonna be like you, Ken, that stuck around and did it again and again and again. And uh, we're gonna see this vacuum of operators that um, cashed out and moved on and went on to other things, and we're gonna need people to start picking it up. Is that it? Okay, nice job. All right, could give a round of applause to our influencer panel. Thank you, fellas. Just put it on the camera, put it on the chair. Thanks, guys.